Okay, welcome Duke alumni and friends to this session of the Duke Alumni Forever Learning Institute, an interdisciplinary educational program organized in a set of thematic courses. I am Dion Troyero, Director of Development for Duke Sciences. And our program for today's theme is Material Sciences, Designing a Better World. Partnering, us, partnering with us on this event is the Duke University Initiative, Energy Initiative, and Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. These two signature interdisciplinary units are in the midst of an exciting transition. Duke is heightening its commitment to accelerate sustainable and equitable solutions to the climate crisis and developing a new generation of climate literate thought leaders. An ambitious Duke-wide strategy will build on the university's decades of successful energy and environmental research, education, and external engagement efforts. As a part of this endeavor, the university is merging the Nicholas Institute and the Energy Initiative. Working closely with, with, school, with Duke schools and other units, the newly merged institute will help advance the university's climate strategy by developing trans, transformative educational experiences, galvanizing and conducting impactful research, and engaging with decision makers at the global, national, state, and local levels. The new institute doesn't have a name yet, but stay tuned. Uh, for an announcement and for opportunities for alumni involvement. For today's program, Planet Saving Science, Addressing Climate Change with Sustainable and Energy Materials, we are pleased to welcome Po Chun Su, Assistant Professor of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science, of course, here at Duke, and Christian hernandez Gallardo, a Duke alum uh, from 1997 and founding partner of venture, a, a venture capital investor at 2150. Po Chun and Christian, welcome to the Forever Learning Institute. We look forward to this um, enlightening conversation. Thank you, DeAndre. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Po Chun Su. As uh, DeAndre mentioned, I'm a senior professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science. And my research is uh, uh, the overarching theme of my research is I, I call it a human building energy nexus, in particularly for thermal regulation. And there's a, a long history that I work on work in this field, but let me just uh, give you one example. So I did my PhD in California, and I, when I moved to Duke, I just discovered a new thing called uh, seasons. So we have winter, we have summer, um, and we realized that we do need both heating and cooling uh, throughout the, the whole year. And so uh, in, in research field, there's a lot of uh, uh, research work in, uh, for example, solar heating, you can save the energy by harvesting the sun. There's also a uh, radiative cooling uh, where we can utilize the cold universe as an infinite cold sink that can provide you coldness and supplement the HVAC energy consumption. And then what my research here at Duke is managed to combine both function together. So we can utilize both solar heating and radiative cooling and to reduce the overall the year round energy consumption. And that was the building part. And then uh, the human part is that when you look at, when you think of the reason we spend so much energy on um, HVAC or heating and cooling, it's because we wanna provide uh, some more comfort, which is one of the most critical need for survival, for productivity, for some more comfort. So another research thought that I've been doing is to provide a localized uh, heat management. If we can utilize, uh, uh, for example, uh, you can imagine like a walkable, portable HVAC, then you can reduce the overall energy consumption for the entire building space, therefore uh, saving energy while maintaining the thermal comfort. So that's what I call a, uh, uh, human building uh, energy nexus. And a lot of uh, uh, fundamental research and also with uh, energy sustainability application in, in, the, in the long run. Very nice to meet you guys. Christian. Thank you, Prashant. Um, hello, Christian Hernandez, uh, Trinity 97, um, techie after Duke turned venture capital investor. 
uh, and through a meandering way, realizing that I could do the day job, be a VC, and actually try to have impact on, on the world. Um, we launched 2150 as a venture capital fund last year. We focus on sustainability through technology in the built environment. And, and why the built environment? Um, well, it turns out our buildings and the way we build and the stuff we actually use to build our, our buildings actually is, is, is A, amazingly addictive. We're building a new Manhattan every single month, but uh, B, amazingly bad for the planet in terms of uh, the carbon emissions and, uh, and, and the energy consumption that it uses. And maybe just to you just show uh, one screen to actually explain why we do what we do. Um, the construction industry is effectively one of the world's largest asset classes, five trillion spent every single year, 13% um, contribution to GDP. Urbanization is half of the world's population today living in urban environments that accelerates 60% over the next couple of decades as we build mega cities around the world. But then you look at what actually generates the majority of CO2 emissions around the world, and it's real estate and construction, both the way we build and how that building actually, the, the, the building itself actually um, um, uh, contributes CO2 emissions. So on the innovation side, and this will link back to, to Pochon's research later on, um, the challenge is that we as investors, as asset allocators, have honestly been focusing on the wrong thing. Um, the, the graphic on the left is a PwC analysis of global uh, share of global emissions by, by, in, by sector, mobility, uh, food and agriculture, energy. And on the right-hand side, an allocation of venture capital investments into that space. So the vast majority of venture capital investments has gone to mobility, effectively the use of some scooters and electric cars and uh, and, and, and batteries to actually power those cars. But if you look at actually where the emissions are coming from, it's industry and manufacturing, how we make the stuff that the world needs, and then buildings and how we actually heat them, cool them, and build them. And that is not commensurate, the investment is not commensurate with the impact they have, where um, industry and manufacturing is 29% of greenhouse gases, but only 9% of uh, venture capital investment. Buildings are 21% of greenhouse gases and only 4%. Of, of green of uh, venture capital investments and that's why we decided to launch 2150 to focus on that space where for us we think about carbon now and carbon later we need amazing science that's currently being developed in duke labs that can actually decarbonize the world in 10 years time but we actually need to start deploying resources um, on the ground today to mitigate 25 plus or minus gigatons of co2 in the next eight years and the built environment is, the, for us, the, we believe the place where that technology is available today, it can be deployed today, and it can actually have an impact today. And it doesn't have to be rocket science. It literally can be as simple as a heat pump for your house, a double pane, um, pane glass window um, to actually improve, improve efficiency. So we invest across different problem sets. Um, as an example of stuff that we've invested in, we we started with the, the world's largest problem, which is our, our, our addiction to cement and concrete. It's about 8% of CO2 emissions. Um, it's uh, it's being poured like honestly like water. And it, it the process has not been innovated on for decades. Um, when looking at the problem set, we actually try to figure out what do we actually want to invest in. How do we actually mitigate the CO2 impact? So we've made two investments in that space. One's a Canadian company called Carbon Cure that injects CO2 into concrete as it's being poured, that absorbs the CO2 and requires less cement. Um, and, and that company won the X Prize last year. It's now deployed across 600, uh, 550 factories across the world. Another one closer to home for, for, um, for those of you in Durham is a company called Biomason. And this is a, a fascinating company uh, husband and wife founding team discovered a naturally occurring bacteria in a cave in North Carolina that secretes calcium carbonate. Um, they tinkered with the bacteria for about 10 years to figure out how much bacteria and how much gravel um, and how much feedstock would you need for the bacteria to do what it does naturally, which is um, divide and then uh, generate calcium carbonate. And so with this technology, they actually make bricks. 
um, and, pa and pavers. And the bricks and pavers are made by bacteria, not by Portland cement. And Portland cement is, is the really bad stuff. It's the stuff that we're all addicted to that actually generates that 8% of CO2 emissions. Um, they're, they're live in production. They've, um, they've actually uh, been deployed across a number of buildings in the US. They're now coming to Europe, which is why we invested. Um, and and it's, uh, it's a fantastic technology that actually looks to nature to solve effectively a man-made problem um, that's actually affecting our planet, and they will not go away. We will continue to build, we will continue to use concrete and cement. Uh, we need to find more sustainable solutions for it. Uh, but I also wanted to call out the hometown hero in our portfolio, which, which is actually an exciting company. And we can talk about some of the other companies that we've backed later on in the conversation, but I just want to use that as, a, as an intro on, on myself and then on the type of stuff that we do. So, Pochan, what should we talk about? HVAC? Yeah, sure. Uh, I First of all, I admire that uh, you and 2150 have done. I think this is tremendous a uh, opportunity for all, all of us to really take on this carbon um, issue. Actually, I, I love that you bring up that uh, it's a, there's a mismatch of what, what's really important versus what's been invested. And I think that's probably because, partly because you know, we're so used to the comfortable environment we are living in. We don't know actually that we are fighting against extreme temperature gradient from indoor to outdoor. And um, I, th I think that once we, once we uh, appreciate that, that huge energy uh, consumption that uh, we, we will rethink what's important, what's not uh, from now on. I, I do have a, uh, a thinking of, do, do you think that the, you know, the, these kind of information can be slowly propagating to the uh, general public that will will all be more aware of the, you know, increasing the increasing the set point of your uh, AC or decreasing your set point of your heater can have a dramatic change of the uh, sustainability landscape. Uh, I think this is something that we can also think of. How to, uh, how to how to have a better, uh, how to pass the knowledge to, to all of us, yeah. I think that the child, it's a bit of an agency problem, right? The, the, yeah. like, I don't think the individual homeowner understands that that two degree difference on the thermostat at their home multiplied times all of Durham has massive impact on the energy that needs to power it. Um, and so there's obviously smart thermostats like Nest and others that help you regulate that, um, sense smart HVACs. The challenge is that, you know, how many homes in the U.S. can afford a digitally connected home system? And honestly, why would you spend, let's call it $5,000 to install it when you don't understand, you can't really compute the energy saving that comes from that, let alone the CO2 like a, a human understanding what the CO2 footprint of a home is, is, is a bit is a bit hard. So we we purposely have not focused on technologies that get deployed by individual homes yet. We have started focusing on technologies that get focused that get implemented by people for whom energy costs are actually a PL line item. So commercial buildings, um, warehouses with required cooling, cold chain storage. For them, they have no choice. They have to invest into cooling technologies, for example. And the cooling technologies is expensive and somebody needs to pay for it. So they can amortize an investment into a technology that is probably more expensive than what they have today. But they can look at the math and say the MP the 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 effect the MPV of this over 10 years means it's cheaper. Oh, and by the way, there's now a local law 97 tax that unless I make my building more energy efficient, I'll have to pay a tax on it. So that actually has an incentive to deploy it. Um, we think that will drive you know, uh, adoption, which will then impact the price cost curve, which will then make it affordable so that the average homeowner doesn't see a price difference between cheap heat pump, uh, sorry, cheap HVAC, or let's say efficient AC cooling. Um, and, and I mean, we all feel really good because we we drive a Tesla or a new uh, or, or Ford Mustang or the new Lightning F-150. We need a lot of people driving cars to actually drive the, the, the big change. We need a lot of households implementing heat pumps to drive the change. Um, right. So I think that's that's a challenge. Yeah, speaking of tax, uh, there's a recent uh, rising trend of 
you know, current market that would you hopefully can bring the more uh, incentive to reduce the carbon emission. What do you think about the the future and 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 how this can affect the landscape of uh, sustainable and energy uh, entrepreneurs? Yeah, so I'm, I'm dialing in from Europe, right, which has a the world's largest carbon cap and trade market, what some people would call a carbon tax, which in, in some in, in, in I, I think in U.S. politics, that's just not going to happen anytime soon. Um, the, the carbon market worldwide is already the sorry the 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 mandated carbon uh, carbon markets already um, significant and affects a number of industries. It had until recently not impacted the built environment. Um, there that is has just put been put into effect in in uh, in Europe, where starting I believe in 2026, you as a building owner as a uh, will be taxed for you the energy consumption the the carbon footprint of your building. Which will incentivize you to take action to implement some more sustainable technologies. You mean the embodied, that, however, the, the cement the, concrete? No, no. So, so, so that doesn't that's be my point. It's not embodied carbon. It's only oh, the operational carbon. Yeah, I see. Um, which is a good start. I think that that's. But I think we need to start talking about embodied carbon and to explain to everybody what that means. When you build a building, you used two really bad things: um, cement, eight percent of CO two emissions, and steel, seven percent of CO two emissions. So just building that building has an what's called an embodied carbon footprint that if you use more cement or less cement, there was no positive or negative effect. Um, a lot of the regulation in California and New York, for example, focuses on the operational carbon, the energy that comes in to power the heating and cooling of the building, the lights that power it. But there's no regulation except for France. That's the only country that has an embodied carbon regulation that incentivizes building owners to think about what they build with. And so LL97 is the law in New York and, 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 and the, um, which incentivizes land, uh, building owners, not the tenants to actually take action. They had to take action year on year to lower the carbon footprint of the building. And to be honest, if you have a mid rise brownstone in the village in New York, where do you start? What, what do you actually implement? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, switch, I'll switch the question around to you, right? If, if you were that mid-rise building owner, what single action would you take that you feel could have the greatest carbon footprint of that building on the assumption that that action would drive value for you as a landlord? I think definitely from the electricity bill, anything that can save the electricity bill or probably task, that would be a direct incentive to install any sustainable product and of course uh, i think the uh, the vendor will will need to have a, a clear spreadsheet of uh, the payoff time that uh, help the consumer to 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 adopt those uh, uh, technology in addition to you know the, the hope to make the earth a better place there's got to be some uh, financial incentive as well um yeah, I think that that's uh, probably the, the the my my answer to that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but so what? But what's the? I don't know if you've done this in your research. What's the largest driver of the energy bill in in a in a U.S. home? It's heating and cooling, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, so uh, that that again, yes, uh, comes down to my research. So uh, again, the, what. What I've been what I've been trying to do is to create some sort of material that can switch between a very very efficient solar absorber that you can be can be used to uh, in the winter time you can use it for uh, as a heat a heat source or as a water heater that's what we we all know for the solar uh, thermal uh, harvester and what's a little bit different from the traditional solar heaters uh, technology is the radiative cooling. And this is actually a, it's a very old technology, but uh, it hasn't been uh, bring up to uh, high performance the, uh, in the recent, uh, until, the, until the past decade. And how it works is the following, right? So you, you imagine you, you, are, you are in the universe and then you have Earth and you have the sun. And of course, the sun is a very is a very strong uh, heat source, and the earth the earth will absorb the, the heat. 
but how does the earth keep cool? I mean, you have the, the, the heating coming in, there is no air between uh, in, in the space. So the only way to go to dissipate the heat is through radiation. So uh, when the earth absorbs the sun, it will heat up and then you radiate through longer wavelengths, which is uh, infrared. So now imagine if our building can reflect all the sunlight while maintaining this infrared heat loss, then that essentially you are cooling down, you are dissipating all the heat back to the universe and that will make you extremely cool. And in fact, if you, if you, if you, uh, if you look at the other side of the mercury, right? This is actually very, very cold, even though it's very close to the sun. That's exactly what happened if you block all the sunlight. So what we uh, try to do is, again, we have a material that can use electricity to switch between the solar heater and the radiated cooler, so we can achieve a uh, heating and subambient cooling. So hopefully in, this, in the winter time, we will be switching this building to the heating mode. In summertime, we'll switch this building to the cooling mode. So kind of like providing this dynamic ability that we are all very used uh, for uh, you know, human bodies, but now we're using this for building because for the seasonality of the requirement for HVAC. So in the end, uh, we are basically uh, utilizing those renewable sustainable energy, which is free and uh, clean uh, for the, directly for the HVAC part of the building energy consumption. And just understand, so this, this would be placed on the rooftop? Yeah, that's a great question. So there are two, I think the, the most direct way is to use it as a supplemental device that can be combined as the retrofitting uh, device to reduce the, uh, um, the consumption of HVAC system. So it's a rooftop device that can harvest heating and cooling energy, or it can be also used directly as a envelope but then you need to play with the uh, insulation as well so you can maximize the utilization of the heating and cooling energy. Yeah. Can you, actually, you just touched on something really important. I don't think a lot of people know what the building envelope, can you explain what the building envelope is? It's basically uh, an ensemble of your uh, roof, a window, a uh, wall, everything that's, uh, again, uh, Distinguish indoor and from outdoor. So, a, uh, a what we have what we've been looking for for building envelope is almost always a higher insulation property because whatever you wanna when you wanna manage your temperature inside, you don't want your external temperature fluctuation to affect to affect that. And that uh, that has been the, the tr traditional wisdom. But we figure if you can now dynamically utilize the sun and the cold universe. You don't you you no longer need a, comp, a very good insulation, but instead you can just tap on the heating and cooling throughout the day, and uh, that has two benefits. The first one is again you are using uh, the free sustainable energy. The second you are saving some material construction material that has like Christian mentioned the uh, uh, carbon footprint in terms of the embodied carbon. Oh yeah, because you got it. Because you're actually using your your uh, yeah. So so building envelope is something that that um, that we discovered it was, is is ma massively impactful. The problem is once you've built the building, right? Impacting or modifying the the building envelopes almost impossible unless you rip out everything and change the insulation. Uh, so super high cost. So. Um, we came. We invested in a company called Aeroseal um, that actually focused on that. It's uh, and I say this to the founders, so I have no problem saying it here today. It is the most impactful and yet most unsexy company we've we've backed to date. So um, your the, the home all of you are sitting in, the building you're sitting in today leaks, period. The ducts that actually transport hot, hot or cold air, the joints themselves have leaks in them. Um, and so the way you can solve it is you tear down the wall and you're trying to find the leaks and then you put duct tape on it. That's uh, massively inefficient. And the way that your building makes up for that loss of heat or cooling through the, through the leaks is that it pumps in more heating or cooling. So it's effectively working overtime. Um, so what Aeroseal does is it pumps in 
it, it pressurizes the ducts in um, in your in the home building, office, hospital, and it pumps in this um, special chemical developed by a professor at UC Davis um, that has like this bubble gum like property. So it gets sucked out through the leak, and then as it, as more of it compresses against each other, it seals. And it's the lowest cost way that a home building, hospital, office can actually seal their building envelope. And sealing your building envelope is the most efficient way to actually increase the energy efficiency of your building. And in those in those states like New York, where you have a tax incentive, it's a single action that a landlord could take to actually um, uh, get the tax benefit, or actually the, the, yeah, the tax benefit for, from uh, having, uh, improving the energy efficiency. And I never thought in my life as a techie that I would be investing in a company that literally takes a, a fan, plugs it into a building and pumps in chemicals. But then you look at, at the, the literally potential gigaton implications that this could have in a gigaton, just put it, put it in context, we're currently emitting 52, 53 gigatons of CO2 per year. If we need to get to zero, every single one gigaton counts. Um, if you actually like, in, um, insulated the building envelope of not every building, but a, a, a good percentage of buildings, you actually do get to gigaton level scale on a global basis on existing buildings without even thinking about new shiny buildings with beautiful, uh, highly efficient uh, um, heating and cooling systems. Well, I, I, don't, think I don't know if you're better than duct tape, right? <laughs> che cheaper than, than breaking your wall and putting duct tape on, yes. Yep. Um, uh, so I mean, a, a company based in outside Dayton, Ohio. Like, it, it was fascinating to discover this company and actually, they just like start doing some of the climate math and realize how impactful it could be. And I mean, like, literally, it's uh, the logo looks sort of like it's from 1999. So. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So when the, if if you if any of uh, the audience have a uh, have used a thermal camera to look at a building, uh, like especially residential building, uh, yep. you'll see some reddish uh, color from, especially from the frame, the window frame. And that, that doesn't mean your house is warm, that means your house is leaking. So what you wanna do is you wanna, you wanna uh, go, go, go get the, those uh, nice ceiling and to re-look re at how, how uh, how well insulated those uh, window frame are, and then maybe uh, replace that with a double pane window. So th th that's absolutely true. Yeah, I have a wind uh, picture for that too. So we're yeah. actually like so. So we we like to focus on we like to focus on the unsexy problems, right? The big stuff that nobody's really thinking about is a problem. Um, I'll talk about cooling in a second, but we're currently doing this deep dive. This is actually honestly you're looking live at my research document with my team, and these are live pictures from New York. This is an old building, I'm going to guess, let's call it 1940s, 1950s. Um, the, the red is the leaking of energy from those, from those buildings, right? You can make, you can put all the beautiful insulation and the Nest thermostat and all the stuff you want to do. That window is still going to leak. And actually, all the energy efficiency goes out, goes, go, literally, sorry, out the window, no pun intended. This is, uh, I think it's called uh, Liberty Tower. Um, all glass, literally just the facade is, is all glass, but it actually uses more efficient um, glass panes. And you can see all the buildings around it, all red, all leaking, and that building is actually meant to stay cool. That's easy to do because they built it with that from the get-go. Replacing every single window in this red building would be cost prohibitive. And the question is, who bears the cost? Is it the landlord? And honestly, me as a tenant, great. You made my apartment more energy efficient. I'm not going to pay a 25% premium on that. Um, and, and there's so little innovation happening around the window space. Yes, double pane windows are great, but they're a price premium to what I pay. And then triple pane windows are great, but they're a price premium to double pane windows. And there's um, a bunch of type of windows that actually have inert gas in it that get activated and others that have um, uh, that turn darker when the sun is shining on them. Price until we consumers will accept a small price premium for better energy efficiency. We think the price premium is no higher than 15 to 20%. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. So, so have you having some sort of a retrofitting solution will be very, very attractive. 
where it's just like a replacing a wallpaper if you can just seal it without uh, easy to implement, uh, no uh, prohibitive labor costs. That would be what uh, I think that would be a niche market right there that we can all think of. So you say that, but um, um, I think you and I talked about it briefly when, when we were preparing for this call. I, uh, I came across this company that is the most, probably one of the most impactful climate companies that doesn't even think of itself until recently as a climate company. It's, uh, it's based in Flor Coconut Grove, Florida. Um, it's a uh, family, it's still majority owned by the founder and, and his family, publicly listed, 6 billion in revenue, 12 billion in market cap. And what it does is that, that through M&A and uh, organic growth, it has become the largest installer and servicer of HVAC company, HVACs in the U.S. It touches 40% of HVACs in the U.S. every year. And it effectively, when, it go, when, when your HVAC unit breaks, they come in and sell you a more efficient unit. And the more efficient unit actually uses less energy, hopefully it starts using less worse refrigerants. Mm -hmm. And that actually significantly increases the energy efficiency of your home, which actually has a CO2 impact. So this company has did its math on um, carbon impact. In 2021, they calculated that they mitigated 11 megatons of CO2. That means probably nothing to most people, but to put it in context, Tesla, which everybody loves as the sexy climate tech company, has publicly stated that through its life, all the cars sold by Tesla have mitigated five megatons of CO2. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it, it's, a, it's a company called Watsco that I literally had never heard about. Um, I am now a very happy shareholder um, that you know, doing very simple stuff, HVAC servicing can have massive, massive impact on, at this point, 11 megatons is just from the US. So we need a Watsco in Europe, we need a Watsco in India, we need a Watsco in China. What's the average life of an HVAC? 15 years? I guess so, roughly. Yeah. So you're sitting in your home, mostly you're sitting in your home with technology that's 15 years old in terms of energy efficiency. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. So, I um, think that's, that's also probably the reason why, you know, uh, the uh, invest, uh, capital invest in, in building sector is so difficult because it's so, Long term, uh, unlike you know scooters that uh, is easily uh, replaceable. Yeah. Yeah, I mean the um, it has been. I think it's changed in the last couple of years, mm -hmm. and I think maybe it's because I'm in Europe and I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it being driven by regulation. Um, tenants are demanding sustainability in buildings, so lead certification or something else. Um, uh, all these big tech companies that have a huge um, real estate footprint are all making net zero commitments. So they're only leasing buildings that are actually at the highest possible level. Employees are demanding it. And then individual renters want to live in something they feel is, is climate positive. But then, right. then you run into regulation. So I live in my house in London. It was probably built in the 1890s. Um, I am not allowed to install double pane window. Yeah. Because uh, the local council thinks that the reflection from double pane window might influence, might reflect badly and actually throw too much sunlight at my neighbor. So I'm, I'm, I'm being asked to actually be conscious about climate and, 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 and believe in COP26 and, and, and support the government's efforts. Uh, sure, I can install a heat pump, but I can't do a very simple action, which is changing my windows. But again, uh, if there is a retrofitting, <laughs> no, no, that will work. Yeah. Yeah. I see a question um, in the chat. Yep, you want to take it? What are your thoughts on geothermal, economic or overhyped? I... What do you think, Chris? I don't have uh, too much experience in this. Um, 
so I, I think individual home geothermal is, is, is too cost prohibitive. What we're uh, community geothermal, which is actually being rolled out a lot in the Nordics, actually, um, and a lot in things like data centers, there are things that require a lot of energy where the capex cost to do the geothermal drilling makes sense because you're going to be using it for a lot of time and using a lot of energy. Um, that's driving it. There's some interesting innovation. There's a company in Europe that does, um, uh, I'm going to confuse it, but plasma laser drilling to make it much more cost efficient to actually drill the hole. Um, it's, I think it's part of the mix of solutions. I think it just needs to have, it, you need to amortize the, the, the capex cost of drilling a giant hole across more than one, either just one building or one large building that needs a lot of energy. I think so in, I, in, uh, in addition to geothermal, even just the uh, using the, the ground as the coal require a substantial uh, capital investment as well, uh, which is also used for data centers. For example, uh, I think the, the, the number is that when you do a Google search, the, num the energy make, make, make it ever a little to boil a cup of coffee or something. So it's it, extremely energy intensive when we do the computation. So the data center, which does all the Google search and all that, has a lot of waste heat to take care of. And so some uh, some solution will just do a, a very nice um, heat transfer fluid, mostly water, and to run through the, the cooling, the, the computer, and run through the into the ground. And I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, we, we use cellar to, you know, to, to store wine and those food is because the temperature on the ground is always, almost always constant. It's always colder. So when you run the hot water into uh, the heated water into the into the ground, you cool down and then you recirculate the cold water back to the computer to cool it down. But you can that, that again it, it works perfectly fine. Uh, it's just that the the, uh, the investment to build that is not uh, may not be uh, feasible for individual household. Yep. Before we switch to questions, I, I do want to talk about. I'm on, a, I'm on a mission to evangelize this because I think nobody talks about it. I mean, if you're if you're in London, you definitely not don't think about air conditioning. You, you think about your boiler, um, your gas boiler, by the way, that is stopped working and 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 no hot water, no heating. Um, so I started doing research on cooling last year, and the more I dug into cooling, the more freaked out I got. And so I shared some of my research publicly. I'll, I'll put it on the chat. Um, Cooling is really scary, and, and, and let me just walk you very quickly through 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 why it's scary. Um, the world is going to require cooling, not because it wants to be cool, but actually because it will need it. Certain parts of India will actually be literally unlivable without cooling. Your body will just not be able to act to 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 um, to actually to live. So this is actually a graph that maps out the 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 growth of cooling AC units across the world. You see China and India shipping billions of units between now and 2050. If those units are based on the architecture and the refrigerants that we use today, we can do everything else in the climate technologies and research around the world, we're screwed. Um, because that cooling, uh, in, ter in terms of I can show the amount of, this is at the average home in the US, everybody talks about heating, that's the red. The amount of energy use in cooling is actually higher than heating just because of the way that the architecture works which it's which is highly inefficient um and by the way you're probably sitting on a, on a cooling unit that you bought years ago and you won't replace it until it breaks and that cooling unit actually uses these really nasty refrigerants which are way 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 worse than co2 uh, which are being regulated out but you still need to get rid of all the stock that's out there and by the way if one of those ac units breaks and starts leaking that's really bad for the planet um, second problem is the energy that powers the cooling is usually used at the dirtiest part of the day when more energy load is actually being powered by coal or uh, non-renewable sources. So you're effectively cooling with really bad energy efficiency, with really bad refrigerants powered by coal. Um, and then there's very little innovation happening in the cooling space, massively controlled by six players. Yes, there's marginal efficiency gains being driven every year. Yes, there's replacement refrigerants. Um, uh, even looking for startups to go back, there's not that many. I'm going to say I found 20. 
around the world that, that would be venture backable today that are not in the lab, but are actually on a path to commercialization. Um, and the, 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 the Indian government's actually focused on this. They did the global cooling prize last year where they're trying to incentivize innovation. We need massive energy efficiency. We need new different use of refrigerants and we need technology that can actually load shift when, when the energy powers or powers up the AC unit uh, to ensure that's actually using more of the renewable stock rather than than uh, oil and gas, oil and, and and gas and and coal, um, and so yeah, so we're we're actively on the hunt for for cooling technologies, which not a lot of VCs are, but the, no, it's a big problem. It's, it's it's stuff that we really don't talk about. It's stuff that actually requires attention and requires innovation and requires commercialization. 100% agree. Yeah. Should we get the entree back to lead some questions? I'm here. I'm here. Uh, just quickly, just wonderful conversation. Um, you could you could sense the genuine interest in your respective approaches to the subject matter, and uh, so fun to fun to listen, fun to be a part of it. I I had a couple of questions here, and I'm going to encourage. Uh, the audience to continue to put additional questions in the chat um, uh, as we'd like to get to some of your questions as well. Um, I, I, I'll start with a question for uh, Po Chun specifically, and then I'll transition to a question for Christian. Uh, po Chun, uh, in terms of um, Duke students currently, um, how are students currently benefiting from the work that you're doing in your research? Uh, so I think definitely what we've been doing is, uh, is quite new. <laughs> so okay. I, ho I hope to bring those, uh, uh, you know, the latest research, not, not, not done by me, but by the, you know, research community to do. Yes, sure. Um, so, uh, they, yeah, so they can learn not just the, uh, uh you know, the, the textbook knowledge, but also how how research has been done and you know with Christian uh, the role model like that uh, we can also learn how this can be you know making real world impact through commercialization uh, so I think my part is really to uh, to to bring those um, uh, scientific and, and engineering part of the, the knowledge for, for them and I, I, I've been trying really hard to to uh, to put something, uh, you know, from the from the even even for a very fundamental or very basic, uh, say, fluid mechanics that the you know on the grad course, I try to be uh, making more relevant to to the uh, to the recent um, development of the of the of the research, and I think it's in particularly uh, relevant to sustainable energy and the uh, um, climate change issue. Thank you. Um, Christian, um, I'd be curious to know how your Duke experience prepared you for the work to do that you're doing today. Um, the irony is that, uh, that I thought I was going to be a doctor like many of us do when we get to Duke <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and uh, Orgo did not go well, to say the least. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, big irony is that um, the the firm that we co-invest with the most is Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is uh, Bill Gates's um, climate-focused technology firm. We've done two; we're working on a couple more deals with them. And the seat, the chief technology officer of Breakthrough Energy, is my Orgo professor. Nice, <laughs> um, Eric Toon. So, so I I have to thank him for for ensuring that I did not become a doctor and allowed me to go into this voyage. Um, no, I mean I think. Duke allowed, gave me, I mean, the liberal arts education, right, allows you to go deep into a bunch of different areas. And venture is effectively that. You're, you're one day talking about chemistry um, of a battery technology. Um, next day, you're talking about physics. Next day, you're talking about business models and commercialization. Actually, all that, sorry, within the same day. So that context switching that's kind of required in a liberal arts education when you're going from your history class to your chemistry class to your computer science class. Um, I think gave me those those mental um, models. 
And secondly, it gave me obviously the network. Um, it's such a, a, amazing how many of my classmates from Duke are actually now on, on this climate voyage. Um, uh, a good friend of mine, it runs a program called Third Derivative, which is a uh, incubator of amazing climate technology companies. Uh, a classmate of mine is an investor of Breakthrough Energy, the, the Bill Gates Fund. Um, another classmate of mine is actually a, a founder of a climate tech company. So uh, we all took different voyages and it just feels that as we all realize the battle ahead and kind of the, the need to actually take action, we're all reconvening through our different channels having been a banker, having been a technologist, having been um, a scientist into the into this space. Um, and actually, I think the, the merger, the, the focus of Duke and the emphasis around the merger of the, of the institutes is gonna be a big um, accelerant for this interdisciplinary type of study that needs to happen because climate is not just science or policy or economics, it's everything. everything. What so and this is for both of you. Uh, what is the next frontier for Duke to tackle in this work and research? Uh, I, I think, like Christian said, there's no single frontier. <laughs> yeah. it goes uh, it goes a very a different way. But I I like the I like the uh, the example of biomedicine. I think that's a great example of how different disciplines can work together. Uh, who would have thought that you, you know biomedical engineer, bioengineering can can do something very very important for for civil engineering, for for building, for energy sustainability, and and again it's a huge span of land scale, right? Microscope, microbes, building. Right? You can't. So I think I think uh, it it's really uh, again I, I appreciate Duke has a really. Uh, a uh, multidisciplinary environment that uh, promote a tremendous uh, communication uh, through different uh, different specialists. Uh, so my, my lab in Gross Hall, which is uh, also where Duke Energy Initiative is. So we have the first floor, uh, social scientist, policy maker, second floor again, social scientist, but then the third floor where I've been a physical scientist. And so we we uh, in in the same building we 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 can just start to talk about how it's possible that you know one of my technology can become a reality or maybe I can have a sanity check of how this technology can be implemented in the future. So I think that the, at least from my perspective, uh, uh, having more uh, more uh, conversation across different uh, different field, and so we can really bring up new. Uh, opportunities, I think that that's uh, that that will be a, a unique advantage of Duke has. Right, Christian, any thoughts yeah. here? Yeah, I agree. It's it's it's, it's inter interdisciplinary science uh, on just both the science and the application, right? So so um, CRISPR, one of the world's greatest recent inventions, was discovered by scientists that would have been working in different fields. Um, mRNA was literally discovered at Penn by the. Right accidental use of a photocopier between two scientists. How do you create those, those bump ups between people looking at a different worlds? And I don't think science can, can continue to be um, silo, right? It's not gross chem hall and biology down the street and then physics and, right. um, uh, and so how, how do you create incentives in science? And that includes publishing and grants and, and funding to actually do that in disciplinary research. In terms of two areas of opportunity, putting my capitalistic hat on, um, mm -hmm. the one Pochan talked about, which is industrial biology. We have mapped as humanity one one thousandth of one percent of the world's living organisms. Mm -hmm. So we have spent the industrial revolution effectively creating all these different materials that we thought we needed with effectively petrochemicals, when the world's been pretty good at creating a bunch of other stuff um, organically. So Biomason just found a bacteria that worked to replace cement, what else can we discover to make, there's companies making fuels out of, out of uh, synthetic biology, making um, textiles, making dyes for textiles. That's gonna be amazing. And that's engineering combined with biology, combined with actually honestly beer makers and fermentation. And then the second one is um, the carbon economy. How, if we start sucking out CO2, what do we use that for? Mm -hmm. And how do effectively create a circularity around or 
bad emissions becoming a positive input in something else. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any additional questions in the chat. If you, if any of our participants or our audience members would like to ask a question, we have a we have a, another minute or two. Um, and if not, um, I would be um, a bit remiss if I didn't mention um, my role. I mentioned I'm director of development for Duke Sciences. I work on DST, Duke Science and Technology, that initiative. Um, and it's the university's investment uh, in the basic sciences. And some of what we talked about here today um, speaks to that. And I wanted to, to throw out that plug for DST. Uh, check out the website. We'll have that added to the chat as well. Um, and I don't see any further questions. So I want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Pochon and Christian for uh, the conversation, wonderful conversation. Uh, and I appreciate our audience members for joining us today. Um, I wanna also thank our co-sponsors, uh, the Duke Energy Initiative and the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions. Uh, know that the session today is recorded and it will be a part of the Duke uh, Lifelong Learning YouTube channel. Um, our next session uh, will be May 24th and we'll explore metamaterials and the future of material sciences. Um, for more opportunities, check out the Forever Learning Institute's uh, course syllabus, and we look forward to seeing you uh, May 24th for the next session. Thanks, everyone, and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>